Hi everyone, welcome back to Higher Biology. We're still going on with Unit 3, Sustainability and Interdependence. And today we're going on to Key Area 5 uh, called Symbiosis. So again, like some of our previous uh, key areas, this one isn't too long, uh, but we're going to be looking at different types of relationships between organisms in terms of parasites and uh, mutualistic relationships and comparing what those both are. So, um, as I said, what we're going to be looking at in symbiosis is these different types of relationships we can find in animals and organisms. So, symbiosis itself is a co-evolved relationship between two species. Co-evolved means that it has evolved alongside each other uh, for an extremely long time on the whole. Now, there are um, two different forms of this symbiotic relationship. So two forms of these relationships that are very closely together. The first one is parasitism or a parasitic relationship, which you've probably heard of before. And the second one is mutualism. So the idea being here is if we look at the image on the left, in terms of parasite, again, you'll have heard of parasite before. Um, it's a fairly common term as well. The idea of a parasite, we can actually show this through a plus and a minus to show the interaction between the two members uh, in this relationship. So you will have a member, the parasite, that benefits from the relationship, but then you will have another member, the host, which does not benefit, okay? It's actually harmed by the relationship. So parasitism is very much one way. The second type we have though is mutualism. So in mutualism, both uh, species or both members who are in this relationship, they both gain. Okay, there's a mutual reward for both of them. And again, we can sometimes shorthand this as a plus plus because it's beneficial for both of them. So we're going to start off by focusing on parasitism here. Um, so as I've said, parasitism benefits one member of this relationship, which is the parasite. So a parasitic organism will derive either energy or nutrition from its host. So it's going to infect a host, it's going to exploit the host, and it's also going to harm it because the host is going to be losing resources to the parasite which it's gaining from them. So we've got a lovely example of a parasite here, uh, which enters into the, the gills of fish, uh, effectively eats its tongue and replaces it, uh, which is a, a lovely picture. And that parasite, for example, it's harmed the host, it is exploiting the host, and it's going to gain resources from the host. And the host itself is going to uh, be harmed by this, and it's not going to gain anything in this parasitic relationship. You uh, have other examples that come across, uh, for example, tapeworms. So through an electron microscope, this is what the, the top of a tapeworm looks like. If you've ever seen any videos or heard anything about them, they can go and uh, burrow away into your intestines and basically uh, absorb the food that you have already digested. Because of that, uh, parasites are something we can sometimes call them degenerates. Um, so although it sounds like a, an old termed uh, insult, it really means that they do not possess, on the whole, a full digestive system because they don't need to. Tapeworms don't need to have a digestive system because they're taking in the food you have digested uh, effectively for them. So parasites often are quite limited. They can have a limited metabolism. Um, they need to be in contact with a host. Okay, They need the host. They need to benefit from the host in order to survive. Because of that, it's not actually beneficial for a parasite um, to kill the host or to damage them too much because the survival of the host is also important for the survival of the parasite. So again, your main thing with parasites, just remember that they gain from the relationship, they exploit the host, and the host is harmed in the process. Now, uh, the next thing we're going to look at in parasites is how they are actually transmitted um, in a direct way. So first of all, we're going to look at a direct transmission or a direct life cycle where the parasite moves on to the host. And there's three different ways. There's either just physical direct contact where it's just passed directly. Um, so it's a fairly straightforward one. There is the release of resistance stages where almost like what we looked at in dormancy in unit two, some parasites are able to survive adverse conditions 
uh, by basically lying in wait until they come into contact with a host. And there's also another one here, which you may have heard of before, uh, is the use of a vector. So remember, vector, we talked about that in terms of the genetic engineering part of unit two, the vector, this idea of transport, is that some parasites use a vector, such as an insect, to actually then go and make contact with their host. So we'll go through some examples of these right now. So first of all, in terms of direct contact, um, this is just straightforward physical direct transmission. So an example of this could be head lice, for example, here. Um, they just get passed from person to person. They can live in the hair of someone. If you make contact with the hair of that person, if you're here, they will just physically cross over onto you. It's a fairly straightforward mechanism of transmission, and we just know this as direct contact. In terms of resistant stages, though, as I said, this, this almost mirrors dormancy, where some parasites can um, lay or grow larvae, uh, which are able to survive. So say, for example, in things like an old carpet, if there's an area that's maybe had fleas. You could have larvae living in there for a period of time um, where there's not a host. They're just sort of waiting for a host to come in. If you then have that old carpet and a dog comes in, then they can go and latch onto that host. So this resistance stage almost means there's a delay in that transmission, uh, but then they come into contact with a new host and they go and um, go on with their parasitic relationship with that host. And finally, this idea of a vector. This is quite a common one um, if you think about uh, mosquitoes and malaria. So the common misconception being that mosquitoes cause malaria, uh, they really don't. The mosquito itself is just a vector. So a vector is an organism which on the whole is a biting insect that transmits uh, your disease, or in this case, a parasite from one organism to another. So for example, a mosquito can, when it goes and sucks blood from an infected individual with this um, plasmodium parasite, which is what then goes and causes malaria, then that gets taken into the mosquito. It does not infect the mosquito. The mosquito is not a host. That's what's quite important. The mosquito in this case is a vector. Uh, it does not know it has it. The parasite is not using it for materials. It's purely using it for transmission as a vector. So the mosquito takes in this plasmodium. It then goes and bites someone else. And the plasmodium goes through the saliva of the mosquito into this other person or organism. So it's basically uh, got a lift from the mosquito where it's passed into the mosquito and then be passed on to a host through that way. Again, a direct transmission. The only difference between this then is uh, there's a, another form of life cycle which we call an indirect life cycle. Now, in terms of an indirect life cycle, we do not just go from parasite to final host, okay, or what we sometimes call definitive host or primary host. There is an intermediate stage. So there's basically a host in the middle um, before you can actually get to your final stage to complete your life cycle. So a good example here if you have a look on YouTube or something for this um, this type of parasite, which I'm not going to try and pronounce right now, uh, this is a parasite which gets passed into snails. Uh, what it does, as you can see from the image here, is it manages to grow inside the snail. So it's been a parasite. This is not a vector. This is very much a host, what we would call either an intermediate or a secondary host. The parasite gets into the eye stalks of the snail it grows and it starts uh, pulsating and basically it makes the antennae look like caterpillars. So it's causing the snail's eyes to look like caterpillars. The snail then puts itself in quite an exposed position and then a bird, which was always meant to be the definitive or the primary, so the final host, uh, comes across, thinks they're caterpillars, eats the caterpillars, now that bird is infected with the parasite. Okay, so the idea being here is that you had a parasite which first of all infected a secondary host, this snail, and used that to basically to grow and then to uh, exploit the snail to be passed on to the bird, okay, which is then that definitive host. So the difference between this and a vector, for example, is that the intermediate host has actually been exploited that has been infected by a parasite. It's not just passed through its system 
to be passed on to someone else. Uh, in terms of this as well, I've shown this almost as a direct chain of transmission from parasite intermediate definitive host to show it's indirect. There is an intermediate host involved as well. But bear in mind this is actually a life cycle. It does not actually end with the definitive host. What happens is this bird uh, eats the parasite from the snail. Uh, the parasite then goes and has a parasitic relationship with this bird. It will use it for resources. It will then get to a stage of maturity where it lays eggs. The bird goes and poos out the eggs and then a snail will come across and eat this infected bird poo. Once it's done that, the parasite is now in the snail, uh, the parasite is going to be passed from the snail to the bird, and so on and so forth in this life cycle that's going on. So again, just remember you make sure you know the difference between a direct life cycle and an indirect life cycle. And uh, take a look for one of these videos, they're, they're, quite, they're quite cool to watch. The final part of this then guys, just from uh, slide one, is mutualism. Okay, so mutualism is a far more friendly version of a symbiotic relationship where both organisms benefit. And we call this an interdependent relationship because they are both dependent on each other um, for this process or for this reward. So for example, we have some Nile crocodiles here and we have a plover bird. Uh, what happens here is the plover bird will go into the mouth of this crocodile, which is not normally a good idea. But what it does is it pecks out the food uh, from between the teeth of this crocodile. The crocodile knows this is what the bird is doing. There is no point in eating the bird because the crocodile is benefiting from this. The plover bird gets a meal by eating uh, whatever's stuck between the crocodile's teeth, whereas the crocodile uh, effectively gets a dental treatment from the plover bird. It's going to reduce any um, chances of infection of any of this buildup that's going on in its mouth. So they both benefit from this relationship. They both gain, which makes it a mutualistic relationship. And just for your interest, there are some other examples here as well. Um, you can either have forms of mutualism where both organisms provide a service. Uh, so for example, you have some um, clownfish and enemies, which they both um, gain from protection with, with these uh, structures. You can have some mutualistic relationships where an organism provides a service and the other receives a resource. So for example, you can see here there's a bee covered in pollen. Um, the bee will go across to a plant to gain nectar, to gain a resource, which is beneficial for them. But in by doing this, uh, the plant is then able, or the flower is then able to pass pollen onto the bee, which is going to be passed to another plant, which is beneficial for their reproduction. And even in terms of resources, uh, we ourselves have mutualistic relationships with uh, gut bacteria. So there's gut bacteria uh, in our digestive system that helps break down food uh, for us so we can get some nutrition from this, but they also gain some nutrition as well. So fairly simple, but just make sure you know in mutualism, both organisms gain from this. So like I said, folks, that's it. It's a fairly short key area in symbiosis. Uh, just make sure there's two, you know there's two forms, parasites and uh, mutualism. In parasites, the parasite is going to benefit at the expense of a host. Uh, and make sure you also know the differences between uh, forms of transmission. So in direct life cycles, you can have direct contact. You can then have um, any form of uh, period where the uh, the parasite is in a resistant stage and can be passed on or it can be moved on through vectors. Uh, also though in indirect life cycles that's when you would use an intermediate host, uh, for example that snail before we get passed on to your definitive host to complete your life cycle. And in mutualism you have uh, two organisms which are benefiting from this relationship. So that's all for Key Area 5, everyone, and I'll uh, speak to you later on with Key Area 6. Thanks so much for listening, everyone.